Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Sue Lawson and I work for Time to Read. Time to Read is a partnership of 22 Northwest Public Libraries and we work to open up reading choices across the Northwest. New Words is a Time to Read project funded by Arts Council England. There are 11 online events and each are hosted by a different Northwest library service. We've worked with five outstanding indie publishers from our region. Carcanet, Comma Press, Dead Ink Books, Knives, Forks and Spoons, and tonight uh, for the second time with Saraband Books. There are two more free events next week with Naomi Booth, author of Exit Management, and, Seal and Sealed, and J.A. Mensah, author of Castles for Cobwebs, so don't miss those and there'll be some links in the chat box. Tonight's our second event with Sarah Band, who are also offering some great deals on books and free postage if you buy through their website. And your hosts tonight are the fantastic Bolton Libraries and Museums team. So now, without further ado, it's over to Emma and the team at Bolton, and Adele and Sophie. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello everybody, I'm Emma from Bolton Library and Museum Services and I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Dr Sophie Franklin and Adele Hay as we take a look at the Bronte sisters through a 21st century lens. Um, Sophie is the author of Charlotte Bronte Revisited. Sophie's currently working at the University of Tübingen in Germany um, after finishing her PhD and she's previously worked in book selling and in an editorial capacity at a small publishing house. Adele is the author of Anne Bronte Reimagined and is currently at Loughborough University doing her PhD on how Anne's works were edited. Adele's also the author of Magical Realist Horror and Bleak Realist Short Stories too. And Sophie and Adele's books, along with Claire O'Callaghan's Emily Bronte Reappraise, aim to uncover and dispel some of the popular myths surrounding the Bronte sisters, and they offer a 21st century take on their lives and works. Um, if you would like to ask Sophie or Adele a question tonight, then please do pop it in the comments, pop it in the chat. Um, towards the end of the event, my colleague Stephen is going to pick up questions from the comments and we'll ask as many as we've got time to fit in. If you do ask a question, please can I just ask that you just preface it with a cue, just put a cue before your question, just so that we can um, identify it more easily um, from amongst the comments. And on that note, I think I'm going to get straight in now with my first question. And my first question for Adele and Sophie is, please can you tell me a bit more about where and how your own interest in the Brontes began? Um, and can I ask Adele to start with this one, please? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so my interest in the Brontes, I was very lucky and grew up just over the, the moors from Howis. And when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my mum's friend decided that we were all going to go to the parsonage for the first time so that was my first experience of learning about who the Brontes were and I remember turning up to the Bronte Parsonage Museum and just being very affected by how close they made the history feel to to us to us now and you know I I remember being very affected by seeing their writing desks and things like that and some of the clothes that they had um, on display there and the things that really that I connected with the most was definitely the tiny books. I remember being a, a very strange you know 11 year old child drawing maps in my bedroom and writing weird little stories and things and then I saw these tiny books that apparently um, they wrote in with tiny tiny writing so that their, their dad couldn't read what they were writing and I remember thinking, wow, these these people were alive nearly 200 years ago, but they, they were doing the same thing that I was. And then from that, you know, my mum's friend gave me a copy, her copy of Wuthering Heights, and I just kind of got obsessed from there, really. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And Sophie, what about you? Yeah, I was a bit later. I mean, I, I came to the Brontes via Wuthering Heights, and in a way... For me, that wasn't the best start. I kind of found it a very disturbing and violent and strange book. I thought I was 
going to be reading a love story and it wasn't that. And I think I was about 13. And then when I was 15, a lot later, um, my mum gave me a copy of Jane Eyre and yeah, it started <laughs> really. And it quite quickly became my favorite novel, my favorite book. And it's just something that I always return to. And I kind of, I did my final year at school project on Jane Eyre and then did my undergraduate dissertation on it and then my PhD, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then similar to Adele, my mum uh, grew up in Leeds. I mean, we moved to Scotland, but uh, her family obviously were still in Yorkshire. So then as my Bronte obsession grew, we were able to kind of go to the parsonage and go to the moors. And that proximity, I think, helped feed <laughs> the fascination even more. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now your books aim to take a fresh look at the Bronte sisters, um, viewing them from a 21st century perspective. Before we get into that a little bit more, um, please can you just recap for me, just what some of the most kind of commonly held myths and, and perceptions of the Brontes are and perhaps how those views were shaped, who shaped them. Um, Sophie, could you start this time please? Yeah, so the main one is called the Bronte myth. <laughs> and this I guess is a kind of um, complex um, maze of different myths. The main one, I guess, is this idea that the Bronte sisters were the three weird sisters, that's what Ted Hughes called them, that they were very isolated, uneducated, um, more roaming, which they did a bit of that, obviously. Um, but yeah, that they grew up in this kind of backwater of Howarth that was very vulgar and violent. Um, and that they didn't really know anything about wider society and wider culture. Uh, and actually, you know, people like Juliet Barker uh, have done a lot to dispel this myth that actually Howarth was quite a bustling small town. Uh, it had, I think, about 32 mills by the time the Brontes moved from Thornton to Howarth um, in 1818. And yeah, it was actually a lot more happening than um, is usually believed. And I think the reviewers, the first reviewers of their novels, I think actually have a lot to answer for. I know that we'll talk a bit about um, in a moment, probably Charlotte's biographical notice mm -hmm. and preface to the reissue of Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey in 1850. But I think actually the kind of initial reviews of their works really worked hard to kind of position the sisters as anomalous and strange and odd writers. So this kind of perception of them as different, I think that's the main myth, I think, um, in many ways. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Adele, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I'm gonna talk about Anne because she's my, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my specialism. Um, so, as well as having all of these things about them being uneducated and isolated, which were completely not true, as Sophie just said, we've got things about Emily and Anne as well um, that made them seem even more alienated. And again, part of that is because of the biographical notice that Charlotte wrote, but also you've got things like Anne was incredibly pious and religious and moralizing, which is very strange to it's strange to think that she's described that way because when you read um, *Tenant of Wildfell Hall*, it you know she's she's religious, but she was very at the time she was considered quite um, radical even in her beliefs back then. Um, but again, like Sophie said, a lot of the reviewers, the early reviewers, have a lot to answer for. But also, there's Elizabeth Gaskell's biography of Charlotte. Yeah, I can see Sophie nodding. Um, it. Elizabeth Gaskell kind of took a lot of these myths that were already there, you know, not long after Charlotte's death, because they were a mysterious family. They wrote under pseudonyms, so everybody wanted to know about them. Um, but yeah, Elizabeth Gaskell kind of took some of these myths that had already been formed and just kind of ran with them and escalated them, um, I think, to kind of protect Charlotte's reputation to a point as well. But yeah, that those kinds of authority figures like Elizabeth Gaskell and Charlotte writing about her sisters, they they pulled a lot of weight. So they carried their opinion carried a lot of weight with them. So if you've got someone like Elizabeth Gaskell saying, yeah, um, Anne was just very quiet and shy and kept to herself, those kinds of opinions stick around for a very long time. And were there not kind of 
um, other voices from the time contradicting those other people didn't offer different perspectives or anything it was just that those narratives were what were given and, and accepted for so long I think um, there were other people talking about the Bronte. So Charlotte's friend, Ellen Nussey, wrote some reminiscences that Elizabeth Gaskell then um, put into her biography of Charlotte. But I think like with, with any biographer really um, from the time, um, Elizabeth Gaskell maybe quoted the bits that she wanted to quote and kind of used Ellen Nussey's, what Ellen Nussey had written to reinforce what um she was writing as well especially when it comes to Anne so you've got Ellen saying that she was the the prettiest member of the family the baby of the family that kind of thing but you know she also wrote about um Anne laughing or Anne smiling to herself because her poem had been published in a newspaper and that kind of thing so yeah yeah thank you now Let's get into it then with Charlotte, because when it comes to misconceptions about Emily and Anne in particular, Charlotte definitely seems to have played a key role in shaping those um, through the biographical notice in the 1850 edition of Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey, as we've mentioned, and also some pretty he heavy editing of other bits of the work and the poetry and things. Um, I'm going to ask Adele to start with this question and, and then Sophie can come in and defend Charlotte. Um, but my question is, what do you think Charlotte's motivations were for this? Why did she do it? And how harshly do you think we should judge her for it now? Um, I don't think, well, we can never truly know what her motivations were as much as we'd like to. And as much as we think that we might understand what she was going through at the time, it's impossible for us to know. So if, even though, you know, I, I, I'm a defender of Anne and her work. I would not like to judge Charlotte too harshly for the things that she wrote about Anne. And she did write some very damning things. You know, she she used a lot of very loaded language when she was writing about Anne, especially. So in the biographical notice, I think that she wrote that um, Anne wanted the originality and the fire of Emily, but she had quiet virtues of her own. So it was kind of a yeah she she That's was saying compliment isn't it <laughs> a little bit yeah um and you know she said she she found Emily's poems and was blown away by them and then Anne also gave her some that she thought had their own virtues and it's she she used words like meek and soft and described her as having a, a veil of religious melancholy covering her face that very few people could get through and things and I think part of Charlotte's motivation was protecting her sisters because she was very aware that reviewers at the time saw them all as quite coarse and um, their subject matter was vulgar and things like that. And Charlotte even says in the biographical notice that she wanted to keep their dear names free from soil. And also you've got to remember as well at this point she was she was going through quite an intense period of grief. She'd lost three siblings very close to each other so yeah I I wouldn't like to be too harsh about Charlotte she she has a lot to answer for but I I don't think it came from a place of malice at all yeah like you say perhaps not our place to judge that um, and <laughs> um, Sophie did you want to add anything to that then yeah I mean I think building on what Adele says I, I agree with everything Adele says I mean I think there were things that Charlotte said about Anne I mean yeah the, the fact that she dismissed the tenant Waffle Hall as an entire mistake I think mm. that is very harsh <laughs> um, and I think though as Adele says it came from a place not a place of malice but a kind of protective one not only I think of her sister's reputation but also her own um, I mean you know, we, we talked about the reviews and they were so, I mean, there, there was positive uh, within them as well, but they were often really um, defamatory as well. And, you know, referred to them as kind of vulgar, coarse. Um, Elizabeth Rigby, uh, her review, anonymous review of Jane Eyre that came out in the quarterly review, she basically wrote that whoever the author may be, it's a person who, though with great mental powers, combines total ignorance of the habits of society, great coarseness of taste, um, and a heathenish doctrine of religion. Um, and that came out in December 1848. And that was the same month in which Emily Bronte died. And so I think 
Charlotte's um, and then of course in May the following year Anne dies as well and so Charlotte's kind of the last one standing um, you know following on from the early death of her mother and her you know other two sisters Mariah and Elizabeth and so I think you know she's got this kind of sense of okay my reputation my character are at stake and the reputation and character of my sisters are also at stake and yeah I think what she wanted to do was kind of try and answer those accusations and try and kind of justify them so this is kind of where the myth comes from that well you know she's trying to say well the reason why Wuthering Heights is such a weird disturbing book is because of where we live and Emily was herself strange which again yeah it's obviously a bit reductive but I think yeah it came from a place of grief and a, a kind of a chance of yeah trying to answer these kind of accusations so yeah I think it's Definitely, she has a lot to answer for, as Adele says, and I don't think that we should kind of, um, you know, just kind of ignore what she wrote. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I think judging her would be unfair um, because these were very biased uh, pieces as well. And I think anybody who reads them can recognize that. So yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> and is that in part why, why you think the Bronte still have such an enduring appeal today as well, um, partly down to Charlotte's editing and things like that, or are there any other reasons why you think we're still so fascinated by them like two centuries later? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure if it's because she edited their work. I definitely think that had an impact and the biographical notice in the preface did influence, particularly Gaskell's life, which then I think had a massive influence to be honest on how people perceived Anne and Emily Bronte and probably still do. I don't know, I, I was thinking about this and in a way, perhaps it is the fact that there's three of them and you can kind of lay claim to one of them and be like, oh, well, I'm more of an Anne person or I'm more of an Emily person or a Charlotte person. So, or you're a Branwell and um, the Parsonage, I think, um, I don't know if they still sell them, but they, they, sold, they sold these kind of like Team Charlotte badges <laughs> and stuff. I have all of them. Um, but maybe I think there is a kind of, thinking of the, bi the biographies anyway, um, and not just about the novels, but there is a sense of you can kind of, um, there's something personal I think about saying, oh, I'm a Charlotte person, for example. I think that maybe is part of it. Brilliant, thanks. And Adele, um, why do you think we're still so fascinated by them 200 years later? Um, I, I love what uh, Sophie said about the, the weird sisters. So Ted Hughes calling them, um, you know, comparing them to witches basically. And I think, yeah, the fact that there are three of them, it's quite, you can romanticize them in that sense, you know, three very close siblings for when they were, you know, with Bramwell, when they were younger, right in their um, childhood stories and things. But um, I think not only are their, their books and their poetry, not only are they very enjoyable still, to modern readers you've got all of the myths that surround them that are fascinating and then once you start to learn more about their lives their lives actually become a bit more interesting than the myths themselves mm. and then on top of that you've got the well how did we get from this the the facts of their lives to all of these crazy myths about them and you know why why do people still think that they're uneducated even though um charlotte and emily both spent time in brussels um, at a school and why do we think that they were so sheltered when Anne spent so many years as a governess away from home that kind of thing so there are, there are lots of mysteries that surround them I think that get people interested in their lives as well as in their books yeah that whole image of them being wild and roaming on the moors <laughs> that is the one isn't it that just still perpetually kind of abounds no matter what. Um, coming on to your book specifically, um, could you share a little bit more about your approaches in writing them and also what you kind of think the advantages are of um, reappraising Charlotte, Emily and Dan, um, their lives, their works from a 21st century perspective? Um, Adele, do you want to go first on this one? So my, I was inspired to write the Anne book after reading uh, Sophie and Claire's biographies of the other two, because I've never read biographies of the Brontes before um, and just kind of nodded so vigorously while I was reading it. And I was thinking, you know, I would really like to do the same kind of thing for Anne here. I feel like there's a lot that I could say about the myths around her and how 
her novels, she touches on things that are still quite relevant to a modern audience. Um, and I wanted to, I just wanted to make Anne's novels and her poetry a bit more accessible to people, because I know with the classics, especially, there's always sometimes that kind of wall of, well, this is over 100 years old, over 100 years old, how am I going to connect to it? Is there anything there that I'm going to be able to, you know, recognise or especially with Anne's poetry, because a lot of it is quite religious and it's about her struggles with faith and things like that. But even I have found, I'm, I'm not religious at all, but I've even found things within her religious poetry that I can relate to quite a lot. And I wanted to um, kind of make those connections a bit easier for people to make. Um, but yeah, there's things like, with the tenant of Wildfell Hall and writing about women's rights and she's writing about um, education and gender equality and that kind of thing. And I, I feel like that's something that's still very relevant today, especially the fact that Anne thought that, um, I guess we'd call it now um, toxic masculinity. She was writing about how that kind of thing negatively impacts on young boys as well, which was quite forward thinking, I think. so. Really, I just wanted to put some historical context back in to make people realise how radical Anne was at the time with the things that she was writing. And also to make it easier to find points of contact with these writers who have been dead for nearly 170 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sophie, what do you think um, about the advantages of reappraising them from a 21st century perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I wrote um, my book in the lead up to Charlotte Bronte's Bicentenary in 2016. Um, and so partly then it felt like an appropriate time to take stock. I think few biographies are kind of self-reflective in a sense um, and kind of reflect on themselves as biographies. I mean, mine opens with, and there's a photo of me in the graveyard at Howarth and then I think this is very weird why am I getting a photograph in a graveyard that's <laughs> like this is just very strange um, and I think I was just interested in this kind of morbid fascination or even obsession that everybody well, that people have including myself with the Brontes um, and in relation to Charlotte Bronte I think even though obviously the myths surrounding her are not quite as intense as the ones surrounding Anne and Emily there are still kind of uh, assumptions around her work um, or kind of, I guess, some of the nuance has been kind of taken away. So often Jane Eyre is read as a kind of straightforward love story. And actually there's a lot kind of going on. There's a lot of kind of supernatural. Uh, Rochester is not actually that very nice, <laughs> nice of a person. He's quite abusive. Um, and I think sometimes actually just kind of looking at these texts with a kind of modern eye or just kind of reappraisal sometimes can help us see them in a different light. And I suppose following on from that as well, um, I mean, you talk in your book about the idea of Charlotte as a, a proto-feminist, um, and I was going to ask whether you would call the Bronte sisters feminists, and do you think they'd recognise themselves as such if they could sort of see and hear feminist discourse and conversations today, do you think they'd recognise themselves in that way? Yeah, so I, to be honest, unfortunately don't think Charlotte would refer to herself as a feminist. It yeah. um, kind of pains me to say that, but yeah, so she's a proto-feminist in many ways. And I think, especially from the kind of 1980s um, criticism of, of Jane Eyre, for example, she, she is, I think, rightly kind of seen as a feminist writer in some ways. So, you know, you have the strong voice of... Jane Eyre, you have those kind of phrases like, I am no bird, no net ensnares me. And, you know, women feel just as men feel. But Charlotte herself was also not in favor of, you know, giving women the vote. Um, she also obviously represents Bertha Mason in quite a kind of dehumanizing way, in a way that I think now we find quite um, disturbing and disheartening. Um, and also even her representation of kind of women working in Shirley, her second published novel in 1849, her friend, Mary Taylor, who was, I would definitely say a, a feminist, proto-feminist, <clears throat> she wrote to Charlotte and called her a traitor and a coward um, because she didn't go far enough in her feminism. So yeah, I think it's a 
complex kind of picture with Charlotte as as a feminist. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if she would call herself a feminist nowadays. And what about Anna Dell? Do you think she'd recognise herself in in feminist discourse at all? It's it's hard to to know how they would respond to modern problems. And again, I I wish I knew the answer to this. I wish I could go and ask them. But um, yeah, I think like with Charlotte, um, Anne was a lot of her, so her books were very proto-feminist. We've got Agnes Grey, which is about a woman who works. It's a book about work um, and it gives us a really good insight into, you know, the loneliness that Agnes felt as a governess. Um, and then we've got The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which is um, a lot of people have, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people have argued that it is the first feminist novel or the first proto-feminist novel. Um, and we've got so much, there's so much in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall about um, women's marital rights. And we've got the scene where, Helen um, locks her door against her husband, which was illegal at the time. And even though it's it's quite serious, I love that um, Arthur in that moment is just written as being dumbfounded. And it's so well written. It's it's wonderful. You know, she locks the door, and he's just like, "What what do I do now? This this isn't supposed to happen." And he kind of walks sheepishly away. But he, the tenant of Walfell Hall as well is full of. Um, we've got the monologue from Helen um, about how she believes that she should be bringing her son up and I think the term um hanging on to the apron strings came from Anne as well um because you've got all these characters telling her that if she mothers her son too much he's going to grow up a milksop and this kind of thing and it's you know they're all very shocked by this stranger who thinks that women should receive the same ed education as as men and be allowed to make their own choices and things and I think um, Anne's preface to The Tenant of Wildfell Hall as well is incredibly proto-feminist because she says in there, as a response to critics, that if a book is a good, a book is a good one, regardless of the gender of the author, you know, um, women should be allowed to write about things that men are allowed to write about and that kind of thing. So I, th I think one thing I can say about how they, how Anne might respond to modern feminism is that I think she would appreciate that people continue to take action and use their voice where they can. Um, and wrote in a letter to Ellen Nussie that she wanted to do some good in the world. And I, yeah, I feel like she would appreciate that a lot of people continue to do that. Yeah, and it, it was very, very deliberate, wasn't it? The tenant of Wildfell Hall and not a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, <laughs> why, do, why do you think I mean, in particular then has been so often overlooked or positioned as a lesser writer than Charlotte and Emily? Is it just down to Charlotte's editing and um, biographical notice or is there a bit more to it than that? So it, it's not, I wouldn't like to put all the blame entirely on Charlotte because it's, it's not Charlotte's fault at all completely. Um, but there are things like Anne's, Anne's, Anne's final poem that she wrote after she found out that she'd um, contracted tuberculosis so Branwell and Emily had both just died and then Anne found out that she was also ill she wrote this very moving very angry poem um, and you can kind of you see in there that she's very angry at God which you probably wouldn't expect of Anne and she writes about how she would like to do some more good in the world before she leaves it and that kind of thing and she really wants to survive and then the way that Charlotte edited it, she completely removed eight verses. She changed the order around and she made it sound like Anne was mourning the death of Emily rather than mourning the loss of her own life. And you you read these two together and you get a very different image of Anne. And so, and, and this was the kind of thing that was, um, that Elizabeth Gaskell wrote about as well. And it's just kind of propagated throughout um, a lot of critical matter about the Brontes but as well as Charlotte's editing there was the tenant of Wildfell Hall was out of print for a long time afterwards and it wasn't printed again until 1854 um, when somebody completely unrelated to Charlotte's publisher and Anne's original publisher 
published a very heavily edited version of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall and they, they did some things for cost like they removed italics and they removed chapter headings but they also almost completely removed a full chapter which is where Helen is talking about how she thinks her husband is jealous of their infant son and removed a lot of curse words and tidied it up a bit but they also removed the the very first part of the novel that sets it up as a letter and so since then you've had a lot of critics saying and bit off more than she could chew and this is a very clunky novel and so there's a lot of um criticism of Anne that is very negative because they say well she started out well with Agnes Grey which is probably a fluke because Tenant of Wildfell Hall is is really badly written and I think that stuck around for a long time until the 60s and 70s I think when people started to realize oh hang on this isn't the full text you know we've not got the full picture here and this, the same kind of thing happened with Emily so Charlotte's edits of Emily and Anne's poetry were more popular and more well known than the originals. So you, you've got a lot of um, criticism there focused on Charlotte's edits and the terrible edit of Wildfell Hall rather than the original texts. Yeah. And who were kind of then the, the first voices, the first biographers to say, right, hang on, let's look at this again and what's happened here and, and offer a bit of a different perspective? Um, Winifred. Garon, I think that's how you pronounce her last name. She wrote the first kind of singular biography of Anne, but she was still working with incomplete texts of poems and, and as a tenant of Wildfell Hall. And that, that biography was groundbreaking because it offered a much more sympathetic view of Anne, but it's still quite sensational at times. And she reads Agnes Gray as completely autobiographical, which is quite problematic at points. But then you've, you've got people like um, Edward Chisholm, who've done a lot for Anne's reputation. And quite a few people have written about how her books were edited and how to know if you've got the proper version um, right up to modern times, really. So there was Samantha Ellis's book, um, take courage about kind of her own journey discovering Anne's work I think she said that previously Emily had been her favorite and then she read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall and as as happens with most people was completely blown away by the subject matter in comparison to Anne's reputation which yeah I, I love that book as well. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I've seen that some questions have kind of been popping up. Um, so if it's okay, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues, colleague Stephen. Um, Stephen, if you want to come on the stream and um, Stephen's going to ask some of our audience questions now. Hello, oh, thank you. Thanks, Emma. And, and thank you, Sophie and Adele. That's brilliant. Um, I've got quite a few questions. Um, our first one is from Tracy, uh, and she asks, uh, Charlotte's trying to shape Anne and Emily's legacy reminds me of Cassandra Austin destroying Jane's personal letters to try and protect Jane's reputation. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it was, I think nowadays we struggle with this idea of people burning a close loved one's letters or, um, you know, writings. And actually... Not that it was kind of happening all the time, but I think it was much more likely to occur for these, these reasons, such as reputation, obviously that was a major um, point in the 19th century and 18th century as well. Uh, and so, you know, even um, Charlotte Bronte's husband, Arthur Bell Nichols, he wanted her to burn, or he wanted Ellen Nussie even to burn the letters that Charlotte Bronte wrote to, to Ellen as well, because they were so kind of incendiary. Um, so, there is a sense, I mean, and yeah, there's this question that hovers over whether Charlotte did burn Anne or, and or Emily's uh, letters or even Emily's second novel. Again, as Adele mentioned earlier, we'll never know for sure if that did happen. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly I think it was more likely to occur. And I wouldn't be surprised if Charlotte did, did burn uh, some of her sister's um, writings or even Arthur Bell Nichols for example as well yeah thank you very much um, a question from uh, Sarah Parker in terms of the I'm a Charlotte fan 
Uh, does this reflect the cultural obsession with pitting women against one another? And how can we value them without falling into this narrative? Yeah, I think we've touched on this a little bit before about how fair it is to kind of pit them against each other, which is a thing that I don't like to do because all of her novels are so different. It's it's hard to even pick a favourite by, you know, all three of them. Um, yeah, I, I don't like to pit them against each other like, oh, Charlotte was this kind of person and that meant that Anne was that kind of person because it, it doesn't feel very productive. And it's where you get things like, I guess Charlotte kind of did it in the biographical notice where she said that, um, yeah, you know, Anne was not as um, original as Emily and that kind of thing. And when when you start to pit them against each other like that, you start to lose... It, it's counterproductive and you start to lose um, the sense of just how good they were as individuals, mm -hmm. um, which I don't, yeah, I don't think it's fair to do, but there is, there's definitely a kind of obsession with choosing one and maybe fitting your personality to them. I mean, it's, it's fun and I, I have a, a team and badge somewhere and it's, you know, when, when you're chatting with friends who also love them, it's quite nice to have those discussions. But I think in a professional space, it's quite counterproductive. Yeah, definitely. I think as kind of Bronte like fans, you and I think it's kind of like, you know, you have certain best friends over others. I mean, not that they're your friends because you don't know the Brontes, <laughs> but there is that sense of you're drawn to one of them over the other. And that's not to kind of undermine, you know, Emily over Anne or whatever. Um, but I do agree that there is a sense of, and, I, and I've noticed this um, not in Adele's book, but in other books on Anne and more recently trying to kind of build her up. There's this attempt to kind of position Charlotte as the villain and the kind of the bully. Whether you agree with that or not, I don't think that to build Anne up, you need to kind of knock Charlotte down. I think Anne's perfectly capable of kind of being, you know, um, on a par with her sisters um, as, you know, as equals. So, yeah, I think there is that kind of competitive aspect and it can tip into a kind of, yeah, more toxic kind of atmosphere um, that's, yeah, potentially kind of sexist, I guess, as your question kind of insinuates that. So, yeah, but I think as a bit of fun, as Adele says, I think maybe it's harmless, although, yeah, maybe not. I mean, both of you mentioned the badges that were on sale at the Parsonage saying Team Anne and yeah. Team Charlotte and Team Emily. And Team Branwell. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Branwell. yes, but the pile for Branwell was bigger than the pile for the other three, sadly. <laughs> Um, and on that, on that, on that um, note, um, from the rather appropriately met, named Charlotte Bell, um, what are your thoughts on Branwell claiming he helped write or completely wrote Wuthering Heights? Or the claim that he wrote Wuthering Heights? Yeah, did he claim that? No. I don't think he did, but... No. Uh... I was like, <gasps> <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's rubbish and that, that is offensive. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember the the name of the friend that said it, but they were notoriously unreliable. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't think it helps that Daphne du Maurier included that in her biography of Bramwell, which was the first biography of Bramwell. I mean, I, I wouldn't read that book to, um, I wouldn't read it as fully factual, but it is amazing. And as part of the, the, the Bronte story, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous at points, but I, I love it. <laughs> Um, uh, question from Eva is that um, about the opinion that Charlotte wrote of her sister's work was this a reflection of a true Victorian opinion of the Brontes so was she, was she just reflecting the Victorian mindset when she was uh, writing a biographical notice yeah I, think, I mean I think yeah perhaps it is a true uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's difficult to say because in a way, as we discussed, I think this was a snapshot of how she was feeling at a particular time. And I think it's quite a carefully, I mean, it is a passionate, it's a passionate kind of piece of writing um, in the biographical notice and preface. But I think it's calculated to have a specific effect on readers. So whether it's her true opinion, I'm not sure. I mean, I think certainly she had... Um, a very high opinion of Emily Bronte as a poet. Um, 
Yeah, but I, I don't know about this kind of true opinion. And then the Victorian aspect, it's tough, isn't it? Because they wouldn't necessarily have called themselves Victorian, right? Like we say that in hindsight, and that we, we have certain associations with that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, certainly she is quite dismissive sometimes of aspects of like Wuthering Heights, for example, you know, how kind of brutal it is and how dark it is. And Heathcliff is this kind of um, devilish, you know, figure. And so that does feel a little bit kind of, um, I don't know, Puritan in a way. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting way to phrase that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's her true opinion. What do you think, Adele? I think the biographical notice is more reflective of the criticism from the reviews at the time yeah. than, than Charlotte's opinion, maybe. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, uh, whether Charlotte or Emily or any of the sisters might have been gay. Um, and it seems like Charlotte had very close personal friendships with uh, female friends. Um, a couple of questions about that. I wonder what your thoughts were. Do you want to go, Adele? <laughs> um, well, it's, it's true that she did have close female friendships with Ellen Nussie and Mary Taylor, but I don't, I don't know how much we can read into that from a modern viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember reading some of Charlotte's letters to Ellen and thinking, well, that's how I would address some of my close friends anyway. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, again, it's one of those things I don't think we can get an answer to from combing through their letters and things. That's, mm -hmm quite a difficult one to answer. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you're interested in this in relation to, because I think there is one about Emily Bronte, Claire does um, kind of respond to this um, characterization as Emily Bronte is potentially a lesbian. But yeah, I'm like Adele. I mean, I think with Charlotte, I mean, I think it's a book by Sharon Marcus, all about kind of female friendship in the 19th century and actually how often, yeah, in letters and stuff, it can seem very intense and also almost kind of romantic. Um, but actually that was kind of just part of female friendship and intimacy during that period. And also it's like Adele says, I think, well, firstly, sexual, you know, sexuality is quite complex anyway, so I, I have no idea. <laughs> but also, yeah, secondly, I guess you are close to your friends. So maybe some of the things I say to my friends seem quite romantic, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Um, following on from notions of romance, um, a question from Percy. Do you think the classification of the Bronte's works as romance has dissuaded, dissuaded some readers from picking it up, uh, given their books encompass a whole range of human emotion and conflict and social issues? Definitely, yeah. I have friends who've said that they were put off by the fact that it's meant to be a romance and, you know, especially things like Wuthering Heights and they might have seen adaptations and gone, Heathcliff is horrible. This isn't a romance. I'm not going to read this. This, I don't want to read about somebody who who hangs puppies, for example. That's not the kind of romantic figure that I want to, you know, think about. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's definitely unfair to call them just romance because you know Rochester doesn't turn up in Jane Eyre until quite a long way into the book and things. And um, like Agnes Grey, for example, is more about Agnes's working life than it is about her romance. I mean, it's it's a lovely romance. It's very sweet, but it's not the focus of the novel. And how you can call Tenant of Wildfell Hall a, a straight romance, I, I don't know. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, and I agree. I mean, as I said, you know, even in relation to Jane Eyre, I think probably of all the Bronte novels, that's most like a romance or love story. But even there, you know, you have kind of recent takedowns of Rochester as abusive. And there's so much going on in that in that novel. It's not just the romance genre. It's got, you know, the gothic realism. And yeah, as you rightly say, this kind of emotional conflict. Um, yeah, so I do think the romance that's fed by adaptations and I think, you know, they kind of are in, con in communication with each other, in conversation with each other. So I think that feedback, feed feeds back into people's perceptions of the novels. Um, on the topic of Wuthering Heights, um, Jessie asked um, that she's heard people say they struggle with it because they feel neither Cathy nor Heathcliff are likeable. Do you think that's a stumbling block for readers, especially younger readers? 
that there's no likable hero or heroine. Yeah, I, I, yeah, when you go, Adelia. I was just going to say, if, if you've been led to believe that Wuthering Heights is a romance, and I think most people before they read it now will think that it is because of adaptations and because of um, popular opinion of the books and things, but I think it can be quite jarring to read if it's if you've been told that it is romance like I was told that it was a romance and I started reading it and thinking it this isn't what I was expecting but yeah it can be quite off-putting for younger readers I think but the fact that they're one of the reasons I love Wuthering Heights so much is because they are mostly horrible people um but you can't stop reading about them the the narrative is just it's wonderful um you know you can't it's it's just a really good book and it's a really good story and even though it's not a romance there's a lot happening there that makes you interested in these characters and want to know more about them and you know continue reading yeah yeah and I think that Wuthering Heights is testament to the fact that just because you don't identify with any of the characters or like any of them you can it can still be a brilliant read and it can still kind of um, engross you so maybe the stumbling block is people's perceptions of the novel before they read it um oh, the, the questions are coming through thick and fast now so i'm just trying to uh, get them out um uh, this question from eva again uh, what are your thoughts regarding charlotte's very low opinion of jane austen and it, yeah. also, it also tags on to another uh, question that um, uh, someone asked earlier on, uh, is that the, this often, she's often, this Bronte is often set up in opposition to the to Jane Austen and that kind yeah. of thing. And, and it's interesting, that doesn't seem to happen with, with male novel novelists. No, it doesn't. And I think, yeah, that's often because I think there's a fundamental, this sounds a bit rude, fundamental misunderstanding of the kind of author Jane Austen is and also the kind of authors that the Brontes are. Like, they are, there are similarities between them in some ways, but I think Jane Austen is, again, not just a love, you know, love story writer. She writes very kind of complex um, stories about communication, miscommunication, conflict and, you know, relationships and dynamics. Um, but I think, and then kind of leading on to that, I think Charlotte also misread and misunderstood Jane Eyre. No, Jane Eyre, Jane Austen. This is this is where the confusion comes in. Um, Jane Austen, because you know, she says, oh, it's all very neat hedgerows and kind of blue skies and all very kind of perfect. And I thought, really? I don't know. Have you been reading Mansfield Park? Have you read Emma? I think there's some kind of um quite dark undertones running throughout those novels. So yeah, I don't think much. I can be so bold of Charlotte's view of Jane Austen because I really love Austen as well. Unfortunately, uh, as a teenager with a lot of bad opinions, I read what Charlotte said about Jane Austen and thought, I'm not going to bother, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, um, thankfully, I changed my mind. And yeah, I would agree with what Sophie said. I think Charlotte read it wrong there. And again, um, bringing it back to what we were talking about earlier, I think it is quite, it's quite, counterproductive to pit them against each other you don't have to be team Austin or team Bronte you know you can you can enjoy both and still have interesting discussions about which one is your favorite I've um, got a question uh, for Adele but uh, it's are you bothered by the fact that many people focus on Branwell's behavior as being the main motivation for the tenant of Wildfell Hall only bothered in the sense that I enjoy getting angry about it. You, know, it's, <laughs> you, you read this take quite a lot and every time you just kind of roll your eyes and, you know, get on with it. But I think I've always thought if there was a character most like Branwell, it's, um, oh, I, this is terrible. I've forgotten his name, but there's a character in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall who he tries to fight his addictions, but he, is always pulled back down by his friends. Um, Hattersley? Hargrave? There's no, the it's, I, oh, I think it's Lord Lobra, yeah. Um, oh, he, yeah. He, keeps, yeah. he keeps trying to 
pull himself out of his addiction to alcohol and his addiction to gambling and things but his friends are always like pulling him back down and he he marries a woman who has an who cheats on him has an affair and things like that and I think you know Branwell might have been a bit wild but I don't think he was bad enough to have um Arthur Huntington modeled on him completely you know <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there's a question um, about representation of the of the Brontes' lives, um, specifically talking about the the French film Les Sœurs Bronte, and um, whether you think it's a, a an accurate representation of of how the sisters lived. But I suppose we could would expand that into the recent adaptation. Well, it's not an adaptation; it's an original work by Sally Wainwright, the To Walk Invisible, and what your thoughts would be on on, on the various representations of the Brontes. I've not actually seen, this is terrible, the Le Sueur uh, Bronte. Um, I don't know if I've heard great things about it, though. I'm not sure. Maybe, Stephen, you've seen it. Um, I, I have, yes. It's, it's very French. That's the best way to describe it. It's okay. <laughs> soft bad. focus. And Emily wears trousers all the way through it. It's... Okay. Oh, well. Yeah. I mean, I loved To Walk Invisible. I think that was, I think it was brilliant. I mean, I think that it does still play on, I think in weirdly in kind of trying to kind of overturn some of the myths, it kind of almost weird, for me anyway, perpetuates them in a sense, like the kind of violence and the kind of, I don't know, isolation in a sense. But then, yeah, I think other than that, it, it was really, really wonderful. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the, the the French take on their lives either, but I, I have seen bits of the, is it from the 30s or 40s, Devotion, the Hollywood film, oh. which, <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's, if, if you can stomach it, I would recommend watching it just because it is hilarious. You know, lots of oh. um, clothing that is not accurate to the period at all. Um, lots of, flouncing, uh, lots of romance, that kind that of thing. Because yeah, that one pits Charlotte and Emily against each other as love rivals for Arthur Bell Nichols. And that's <laughs> just like, okay, of course, a woman couldn't write Wuthering Heights without being in love. And then they claim that she dies from like love, like she's forlorn for Arthur who loves Charlotte. And it's like, it's just very reductive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I really liked about To Walk Invisible was how Anne was represented. You know, she she does have, there's, there's a bit in it, I think, where she has a bit of a breakdown, a bit of a cry. And it's not because, you know, she's upset about his behaviour, it's because she feels like she didn't do enough. And I, I felt like that was very representative of Anne in general. Um, there's a question uh, about the... There's a new movie, Emily, um, based on the life of Emily Bronte, where they've invented a love interest. And I think that harks back to devotion. And um, so have you, have you read about that or seen any? any uh, yeah, is it like a big blockbuster? It's quite a big one, isn't it? I can't remember who's yes. in it. Though. No. Um, and also on the subject of relationships from Erica, um, uh, what are your thoughts on the relation between Charlotte and Arthur Bell Nichols? I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think Charlotte seemed very happy, um, which then I think is lovely. I think some people kind of are quite harsh about their relationship and see it. I mean, they claim that then she stopped writing. I mean, she didn't write very much, but then that's also because they got married and then she died very soon after. So really, I think to suggest that he was the reason why she didn't kind of write very much after that is is unfair so yeah i mean i think good yeah congrats to them <laughs> i think it's very nice <laughs> yeah i don't know sorry i don't really have an opinion about the relationship I, th I guess it's yeah she seemed happy and that i think is very nice and she had companionship and yeah i think he gets a bad reputation because one of the things people know most about him is that he requested that Charlotte burn her letters and that 
um, Ellen Nassib burn her letters from Charlotte as well. So you read that and you think, oh, that's a bit weird and controlling. But, you know, like we, we said earlier, that was quite a popular practice, really. And he knew that his wife was famous as well. He knew Charlotte um, was a bit of a celebrity. And I think, again, it just came from a place of wanting to protect her. Um, and a last question, because we've got five minutes left. Um, who do you think the main character of Wuthering Heights is? Ooh. Um, I'm, so yeah, it says Catherine Heathcliff or Nelly. Nelly, yes. Yeah. The story. So I actually think in a way, I mean, I don't, not that he's the main character, but Lockwood does ultimately control the narrative. So for me, Anything, everything that happens, everything that's told to him, he ultimately is the one controlling that. And so, and he even says kind of halfway through the novel, um, oh, you know, I'll continue um, what Nellie told me and she's a very good storyteller. And, you know, I'll only kind of change bits here and there. And you think, oh, what did you change Lockwood? That's quite interesting. So I think, yeah, in that sense that he controls it. And I think he has kind of ultimate kind of power over actually how people are described, how they are actually represented ultimately. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I guess it would be Catherine and Heathcliff as the kind of protagonists, like it's their kind of story that propels you on in a sense through Lockwood and then through Nelly. I don't know, maybe Adele, you have a different take. My first reaction to that was Nelly Dean, but after hearing you talk about um, Lockwood, it's kind of changed my mind a little bit but yeah um I guess Nellie is the thread that holds everyone together she holds you know you go from the first generation Kathy and Heathcliff through to the younger Kathy mm -hmm. and Nellie is there to witness all of it and the only opinion that we have of any of these other characters is Nellie's opinion as she's narrating it to Lockwood so she I don't know she's not the your typical protagonist because she's not propelling the action but the whole thing is very you know she might be an unreliable narrator we're only getting her point of view here so yeah that that's a really interesting question and I'd never really thought of it before yeah. um, there are quite a few more interesting questions as well but I think we're running out of time um, and also uh, someone pointed out early on in the comments that um, Today is, is Patrick Bronte's, I think it's 244th birthday. So it's a fitting time to have a Bronte discussion. <laughs> and also St. Patrick's Day. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there are quite a few people saying thank you and wow. how great it's been in the comments. Thank so. you. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, everyone. And um, thank you, Stephen, for picking up those audience questions as well. Um, and I'm just going to finish off by saying thank you to everybody for watching this evening. The audience questions were absolutely brilliant. It's been a really enjoyable discussion. And um, thanks to Sue and Time to Read and Arts Council England and the publishers for the New Words Festival. And finally, a huge thank you to you, Sophie and Adele, for being here tonight and for giving us that insight into your works about the Bronte as well thank you very much thank um, you thank you, thank so you. Much for your questions as well they were really great thank yeah, you they were good <laughs> lovely thank you bye bye everybody